Hello and welcome. In this educational aid, we are going to cover the space environment and its effect on spacecraft. The space environment effects can be grouped into six categories. Vacuum, neutral, plasma, radiation, micrometeoroid, orbital debris, and scintillation. And depending upon which orbital regime your spacecraft is operating, the impacts of these effects on your space mission can range from negligible to mission threatening. This educational aid explores the space environment effects depending upon orbit and how each of the subsystems can react to the space environment. If you need more information on spacecraft subsystems, please reference the spacecraft subsystems educational aid. The vacuum environment. The vacuum environment is characterized by the lack of atmosphere like we have on Earth and very low pressure. As we detail this environment, we will look at how the near vacuum of space and lack of pressure, the resultant outgassing, and UV degradation affect spacecraft. Atmospheric pressure is about 10 orders of magnitude less at orbital altitudes such as 350 kilometers than on the surface of the Earth. This significantly reduced pressure affects structures, payload, and thermal control subsystems. The lack of pressure can affect structure subsystems because of outgassing. Outgassing is the loss of material mass as a result of volatile chemicals inside the material surface escaping into the vacuum environment or onto the spacecraft itself, leading to contamination. The vacuum environment also presents challenges in thermal control. Without the presence of an atmosphere, the spacecraft primarily uses radiation to aid in heat transfer for cooling. Depending upon the material properties used and contamination buildup due to outgassing, cooling can be further hindered. Outgassing is one of the greatest sources of contamination on the spacecraft. An example of outgassing on the surface of the Earth is the odor or smell given off by a rubber tire. In the vacuum environment, outgassed material escapes in random directions. Depending on where these escape particles go, the buildup of material can degrade solar arrays, fog up sensors, and alter thermal properties of structures and other subsystems. Additionally, in the vacuum environment, we need to take into account ultraviolet degradation. The Earth's atmosphere protects us from most of the harmful radiation from the sun. However, in space, our spacecraft aren't so lucky. As a result, ultraviolet radiation emitted by the sun adversely affects many materials on satellites. This radiation interacts with many surfaces on the spacecraft and over time can change the molecular composition of many materials, specifically by the removing of oxygen molecules from materials. As a result, the thermal control subsystem may not operate as desired, optics can be degraded, and solar rays may not be as efficient. The neutral environment. The neutral environment deals with the Earth's atmosphere and how it reacts with the sun's energy and interacts with the Earth's electrical and magnetic forces. Because we are primarily interested in how the neutral environment affects spacecraft, we will focus on the area of the atmosphere from 100 kilometers up to 1,000 kilometers. So essentially, the thermosphere and the exosphere portions of the Earth's atmosphere. Again, we just talked about the vacuum environment, but it is important to note that there's still a little bit of atmosphere left. And this little bit has an effect on spacecraft. From 100 kilometers to around 650 kilometers, molecular oxygen is the most prevalent component in this region of the atmosphere. However, solar energy breaks down molecular oxygen quickly and forms atomic oxygen. The solar cycle will affect how much atomic oxygen is present. During the minimums of solar cycle, there is less atomic oxygen than during solar maximum. But no matter where we are in the solar cycle, atomic oxygen is present. Atomic oxygen or the neutral environment affects spacecraft in several ways. We will discuss three. First, atomic oxygen reacts to various materials, leading to erosion, oxidation, and general degradation of material properties. For a spacecraft with shorter mission life, this tends not to be too great of an issue. But for a spacecraft with longer mission life, this needs to be considered to ensure the satellite will work throughout the full mission lifetime. 
The next effect is drag. Drag is caused by the density of all the constituents in the allele atmosphere. From 100 kilometers to 650 kilometers, atomic oxygen is the primary constituent in this range. The drag experienced by the spacecraft is much lower than that experienced by a plane or a car at or near the surface of the Earth. But it has a significant effect on the spacecraft and its orbit. Drag acts as a small series of retrograde thruster firings by the spacecraft, robbing the spacecraft of energy. As the spacecraft orbits the Earth, the spacecraft's apogee gets smaller and smaller, eventually circularizing elliptical orbits and eventually reducing the orbital altitude and energy. Finally, it can bring the spacecraft into early reentry. However, drag can be overcome by orbit prograde thruster firings, restoring energy to the orbit. For more information on energy, please see the Conservation of Energy Educational Aid. The last effect is not well understood, but is a factor of the neutral environment. This effect is spacecraft glow. Some external spacecraft material, when they react with the neutral environment, can glow. Spacecraft glow does not seem to harm the spacecraft, but depending on the mission of the satellite, such as observations, spacecraft glow can have an adverse effect to the mission of the satellite. The plasma environment. Plasma environment affects orbits from LEO all the way out to GEO. The plasma environment is characterized by the charged particles, specifically electrons and ions, and their interaction with the spacecraft. In space, plasma is formed in two ways. First, when atoms are excited by solar charged particles and releasing electrons, creating ions. This process is called ionization. Second, by charged particles from the sun that are trapped by the Earth's magnetic fields forming the Van Allen radiation belts. In both cases, electrons and ions interact with the surface of the spacecraft causing an electrical charge buildup or a potential difference. The rate of potential difference buildup is dependent upon several factors. Some factors include orbital altitude, inclination, and spacecraft material. However, as the potential difference increases, the charge needs to equalize. It does so by arcing. Arcing is an electrical discharge. Depending upon the current and voltage, the arcing can cause minor issues such as sputtering or pitting of surface materials to causing permanent damage to electronic components. The radiation environment. The radiation environment is characterized by highly energetic particles reacting with the spacecraft. These energetic particles are either charged particles, such as electrons and protons, or uncharged particles like neutrons, such as gamma rays and x-rays. These charged particles are much more energetic than particles in the plasma environment by orders of mega electronic volts. Unlike the plasma environment, these energetic particles can pass through surface material of the spacecraft, affecting the internal components. The effects on the spacecraft include degradation of component material, decreased solar ray power output, solar ray degradation, and single event upset. Single event upset is the flipping of a bit of data from a 1 to a 0, or from 0 to 1, that is received by the spacecraft or any of its electronic components. This can result in missed or fraudulent commands being interpreted by the spacecraft. Concerning the radiation environment, we are going to cover three sources of charged particle radiation and their effect on spacecraft. They are the trapped radiation in the Van Allen radiation belts, solar particle events coming from our sun, and galactic cosmic rays coming from nova or supernova explosions from outside our solar system. The Van Allen radiation belts are two regions of increased charged particle radiation. The exact bounds of these belts vary due to fluctuations of the Earth's magnetosphere, which compress and move the belts due to solar activity. The lower belt starts at 500 kilometers and extends to 6,000 kilometers. However, this lower belt has an area called the South Atlantic Anomaly that dips down to 200 kilometers over the Southern Atlantic Ocean. The South Atlantic Anomaly affects virtually every satellite in LEO. The outer belt ranges from 13,000 kilometers to 60,000 kilometers, affecting a large portion of the Mio belt and all of the Geo belt. Solar particle events are solar flares, solar storms, and coronal mass ejections from the sun. 
These events send high volumes of particles in all directions. Occasionally, those directional events intersect the Earth's trajectory. When that occurs, they cause problems. These events tend to last for a couple hours, but their effects can linger for weeks. The Earth's magnetosphere helps protect the Earth from some of the harmful effects of these storms. However, only some satellites are protected by the magnetosphere depending on their orbital altitude and inclination. The lower the altitude and inclination, the more likely the satellite will be protected. Again, as mentioned in regards to the Van Allen radiation belts, solar storms can compress the Earth's magnetosphere and expose the geo belt to these storms and their harmful effects. Galactic cosmic rays are comprised of hydrogen, helium, and heavier ions. The magnetosphere does tend to protect some orbits as with the solar particle events, as mentioned earlier. But these heavy, high-energy galactic cosmic rays can penetrate the magnetosphere, spacecraft structures, and penetrate below the Earth's surface. However, the main effect of galactic cosmic rays are single event upsets in the spacecraft. The Micrometeoroid Orbital Debris Environment. The Micrometeoroid Orbital Debris Environment affects all of our orbital regimes to one degree or another, but the threat of orbital debris is much greater in certain orbits than others. Micrometeoroid Orbital Debris entails, as the name suggests, micrometeoroids and orbital debris. Micrometeoroids are the remnants from comets, asteroids, meteor showers, and the like. And ever since Sputnik, man has been creating orbital debris. Orbital debris is comprised of non-functioning satellites, rocket bodies, broken parts of satellites from collisions, explosive bolts used to store and release satellites from launch vehicles and other satellite components, and specks of paint. The smaller the orbital debris, the harder it is to track. It is believed there is well over 100,000 pieces of orbital debris less than 4 centimeters in size. Why the physical composition of micrometeoroids and orbital debris may be different, and the likelihood of receiving a strike from micrometeoroids is much less than orbital debris, we group these two areas into the same environment because of their relative velocities. Recall from the Kepler's Laws and Conservation of Energy Educational Aids that kinetic energy is energy in motion. Both micrometeoroids and orbital debris pack a lot of kinetic energy. On average, micrometeoroids have a velocity of 17 kilometers per second and tend to have an impact velocity to on-orbit satellites of 19 kilometers per second. Micrometeoroids can strike the spacecraft from any angle and cause great damage to the impact area. Orbital debris has an average velocity of 8 kilometers per second and an average impact velocity of 10 kilometers per second. Orbital debris tends to impact the spacecraft on the ram side or the front of the satellite in the direction of satellite motion. I mentioned earlier that there is believed to be over 100,000 pieces of debris on orbit that is less than 4 centimeters. And objects that small tend not to have a lot of mass, such as a speck of paint mentioned earlier. So what is the issue? Recall that kinetic energy is equal to 1 half times the mass of orbital debris, usually really small, times the velocity of orbital debris squared very large. So the issue is velocity. To put this in perspective, a piece of debris about 3 millimeters in size traveling at 10 kilometers per second has the same kinetic energy of a bowling ball traveling at 100 kilometers per hour or about 60 miles per hour. And a piece of debris 1 centimeter in size will have the equivalent kinetic energy of 180 kilogram or 400 pounds safe moving at 100 kilometers per hour or 60 miles per hour. So as you can imagine, the effect on the spacecraft can be quite catastrophic, depending on where on the spacecraft the micrometeoroid or orbital debris strikes. And the last area we will cover is scintillation. Scintillation is characterized by the rapid and random variations of radio signals due to changes in the ionosphere's electron content. Scintillation actually means a flash or sparkle of light. We can see this sparkle when we look up into the night sky. When we do, we see the stars seem to twinkle. The stars are not dimming and brightening, but rather the starlight is being refracted or bent as it passes through the ionosphere due to random 
and rapid variations in the density of the ionosphere. Recall from the Electromagnetic Spectrum Basics Educational Aid that visible light is just one part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So if the ionosphere has this effect on visible light, does it affect other portions of the spectrum? The answer is yes. Scintillation affects the lower frequency, higher wavelength portions of the EM spectrum. When it comes to spacecraft, scintillation affects the radio bands the greatest by imparting low frequency noise to these signals. The amount or the degree scintillation affects communication is a factor of satellite inclination, local time, season, geomagnetic activity, and solar cycle. The two areas that have a greater probability to be affected by scintillation are lower orbits with high inclinations, specifically around the auroral regions, and when orbits pass near the equator. The auroral areas tend to be affected by scintillation because charged particles traveling along the magnetosphere pass through the ionosphere creating the auroras. Additionally, the charged particles form unstable areas of compression and troughs in the ionosphere. These areas of compression and troughs distort radio frequencies. Just as the auroras are stronger during the night, so are the effects of scintillation. Typically, these effects of scintillation are greatest during local times of sunset to 3 a.m. and during times of greater geomagnetic activity. Also, at the equatorial regions, scintillation primarily occurs only during nighttime. After sunset, bubbles of ionization occurs at the bottom of the ionosphere and travel upward through the night, typically ending by midnight. Lower frequency communication through these bubbles can be affected. Well, that is it on the space environment. I am Jeremy Brown with the National Security Space Institute, and I hope you enjoyed this educational aid.